Eight years ago this month, the disappearance of Heather Elvis shook the Grand Strand. And today, the woman found guilty in her kidnapping is appealing her sentence. But we want to remind you of everything that has happened so far in this case. It was December 17th of 2013. That's when Heather Elvis was last seen at her home after a date. The following day, her cell phone pinged for the last time in Saucesty. That was at around 3 a.m. The day after that, her father reported her missing and her car was found at Peachtree Landing. Two months later, on February 21st, police arrested Sydney and Tammy Moore in connection to Heather's disappearance. They were originally charged with murder and kidnapping. The murder charge was dropped. In 2016, Sydney Moore's first trial ended in a mistrial. In 2017, Sydney was tried on obstruction of justice and found guilty. Fast forward to October of 2018. Tammy Moore was found guilty of both kidnapping and conspiracy to kidnap. She was sentenced to 30 years on each charge. And one year and one month later, Sydney Moore was found guilty of the same charges. Today, lawyers for Tammy Moore officially had their day in court in front of the State Court of Appeals, arguing that witness testimony providing an alibi for Moore should have been heard and that a new trial should be granted to include it. But back in 2018, a judge said that evidence most likely was compromised. ABC 15's Andrew James joins us now live in the studio with what happened in court today. Andrew. Jen Moore's lawyers continue to argue that Tammy had no connection to Heather Elvis' disappearance and that several parts of that 2018 kidnapping trial were mishandled. The state stood by its evidence and expert testimony. She simply did not receive a fair trial. Tammy Moore is serving 30 years following a kidnapping conviction in the case of Heather Elvis, whose whereabouts remain unknown. And we respectfully request this court to grant a directed verdict in Ms. Moore's favor. Or request a remanded trial. That's what Tammy's lawyers are asking. They say the judge back in 2018 wrongfully denied Moore's children and her mother from testifying as to her alibi in mid-December 2013 when Elvis was taken. The judge's exclusion of these witnesses was an extreme remedy that basically sawed off appellant's defense at the knees. The action came after an Horry County Sheriff's deputy testified that the family was seen watching the trial's live stream against what the judge had ordered. The defense also appealing that some expert evidence was wrongfully kept in the case, but the state argues that they were not opposed to the testimony during the trial. There was no objection um, to this testimony, not, not a, certainly not a timely objection. Then there was the appeal that the state went too far with Tammy and Sydney Moore's phone records. Clearly it wasn't admissible. It was an abuse of discretion to admit those text messages. Attorneys for the state argued that those messages, graphic as they may be, showed that Moore's defense of an open relationship was invalid and that the motive of jealousy towards Sydney's and Elvis's relationship was evident. What we're showing is she is pushing Sydney to do this. We're showing control of the phone, which is everything. That evidence was used to also convict Tammy Moore on conspiracy to kidnap. Sidney Moore's appeal was denied more than a year ago. Last December, his attorneys filed a petition to have the state Supreme Court hear it. Florence parents and community members had a chance to share their thoughts on proposed changes to Florence One school disciplinary policy. The changes were brought to the school board last month after leaders reported more than 200 fights in the first 90 days of the school year. ABC 15's Carlos Flores joins us live in Florence after sitting in on that meeting. He has a full recap for us. Carlos. Jennifer, tonight was not only a chance for people to learn more about those proposed changes, but to create a dialogue and find other ways to deter violence in the district. Everyone who did speak tonight does believe, though, a zero tolerance policy should not be put in place. During last month's Florence One school board meeting, Superintendent Richard O'Malley proposed that any student who fights would get expelled. He also wants students who assault staff members to be expelled and those who threaten staff members to be sent to the alternative school for four to five days. Tonight, people suggested the need for more counseling, making the code of conduct more accessible and easier to read and bringing back mentorship programs. One parent whose child was recently expelled believes district leaders need to step up and find other ways to handle this problem. It is very serious. It's a very serious matter. The board has to step in. Dr. O'Malley has to step in and make the decision to get these kids help. Because if they don't, if we don't understand why they're doing the things they're doing, we won't ever get, we won't ever have a solution. 
I also caught up with board member Alexis Pipkin Sr. who called tonight's meeting about his takeaways. I asked him what was suggested, what could be put in place right away, and he believes bringing back an old mentorship program should definitely be on the table. That is an immediate piece to revitalize and to ensure that that program is immediately put back in place to ensure that we create a cadre of uh, volunteers to ensure that we're able to provide support. And the second piece as it relates to immediately, we need to eliminate this approach of this zero tolerance. A new development has joined the list of proposals for Horry County Planning Commission. Now we first told you about the commission's latest project in the Burgess community last week. Last night, community members met with county leaders to get a better idea of what a new development would look like in their neighborhood. They also got to ask questions and share their concerns. This is the area in question. Now it's right off of Highway 707. It's east of the Waccamaw River. Thomas and Hutton is proposing the development fill just over 700 acres of land, including nearly 4,000 single and multifamily homes. Thomas and Hutton is also proposing that they fill that land. And again, we're talking thousands of homes. ABC 15's Emma Parkhouse is working for you following the story. And today she spoke with a few Horry County Council members who represent the Burgess area where the development will be going. So Emma, who did you speak with and what did they have to say about this option? Well, Jed, I spoke with a couple different councilmen today. I spoke with Cam Crawford from District 6, District 6 and Gary Loftus from District 4, both representing that Burgess area community. Councilman Loftus says there's potential for this to be a great project, but there's still a lot more work to be done first. Thomas and Hutton say they're looking to start building homes within the next few years. And Horry County Councilman Gary Loftus says he's been closely following the proposed rezoning plan in the Burgess area. They got a lot of work to do, and if they try to rush it, they're, you know, that that they may negate anything they might have gained. But he says with the plans he's seeing right now, he has concerns of his own. They say their lot size is 5,000 square feet. Well, stop and think about how big is 5,000 square feet? How big is it? 50 feet by 100 feet. Not very big. Traffic was another concern the councilman addressed, but says addressing community concerns are at the forefront when dealing with growth in Horry County. I haven't been talking with them. They've been talking to me. <laughs> People would seek me out and, and give me their opinion, uh, and their opinions were pretty much universal. So I asked Councilman Loftus. How are you going to incorporate community concerns when looking at this community being built in the Burgess area, if it comes to that. Well, I mean, it, it's, let's put it this way, it's got a long way to go. This cake isn't even in the oven yet. It's got a long way to go. And uh, if, they, if they're if they bound and determined to rush it through, then they're gonna have to live with the consequences. But if they want to sit down and say, okay, how can we make it work? That's a whole different ballgame. In addition to listening to the community, Loftus says another group plays a large role in helping the council as a whole make decisions on developments. We take a, a real good close look at what the uh, planning commission sends to us. Uh, if we didn't, what would be the sense of having it?